So we're going to be in Luke chapter 13, eventually reading verses 1 through 21, but we'll start with verses 1 through 9. Luke chapter 13, 1 through 9. Now on the same occasion, there were present, there were some present who reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this faith? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he began telling them this parable. A man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and did not find any. And he said to the vineyard keeper, Behold, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? And he answered and said to him, Let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig around it and put in fertilizer. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, cut it down. So Jesus is speaking, and he's encountering some people, and they come to him with a couple of things that had happened recently. And they asked him about an event that had apparently taken place uh, in Jerusalem. Galileans were offering sacrifices. Pilate apparently had them killed. We know of another incident where he, he did have people killed in a crowd by Roman soldiers. But their blood mingled with the sacrifices. This would have been a profanity to, to the Jews to have human blood mixed in with animal sacrifices offered to the Lord. And so they asked him about this. They may have been challenging him to speak about Pilate. You know, the Pharisees tried to bait him. We don't know who raised this question to him, but they may have been trying to get him to talk politics. It's one of those darned if you do, darned if you don't things. And Jesus didn't take the bait. He answered them, not about Pilate, but he answered them with a question, which he so often did. And he turned the question to those Galilean themselves. He said, were they greater sinners than anyone else because of this? And what he's asking is, yeah, they were killed. Their blood was mingled with these sacrifices. Does that mean they were bad people? Was God punishing them? And Jesus' answer says, no, sin is sin. Whatever it results from, sin is sin, and you will perish unless you repent. Repent. Metanoia is a Greek word. It means to change, to turn from one thing to another. It's a 180-degree turn. To turn away from your sin, to repent, express sorrow, but it's more than expressing sorrow. It's seeking forgiveness and turning to Christ for that forgiveness. So he said, unless you repent, you will perish. Then he went on to mention another current event. Apparently a tower had fallen in the town of Siloam and killed 18 people. And he said, were, were they bad people? This was apparently an accident that happened. And he says, no, they're no worse than all who live in Jerusalem which was the holy city. So he's including the priests, the Levites, everyone around the temple worship. He's saying they're no worse than those people, but they're sinners. Again, he comes back to the fact they're sinners. And Jesus says what Paul writes in his letter to the Romans, in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Jesus wasn't interested in the political question. He was interested in people who need forgiveness and who need to repent and turn to him. Now, we say, well, in A.D. 27 or whenever this was, that sounds good, that people needed to hear that. I'm going to repeat it. Jesus was not interested in the political question. He was interested in people who needed to turn away from their sins and repent. Does that apply today? Not a lot of agreement there. That's interesting. And I know you probably agree, you just don't nod your heads in church because you're good Baptist. But he's not interested necessarily in the political situation. I'm saying we don't stand up for what we believe. But we should be more concerned with people's souls and the fact that they are going to hell than with their politics. So Jesus expressed that and said these aren't greater sinners. They're sinners. Two circumstances cause death, apparently oppression from Pilate and then an accident, but their sin caused neither. You remember the book of Job. Job had lost just about everything, and his so-called friends came to him. Three friends came up. The best thing they did was shut their mouth for seven days and just sit with him. But then they opened their mouths, and they kept insisting, you must have done something wrong for God to do this to you. And Job said no. He wasn't self-righteous. He was righteous. He said, I didn't. And then if you remember, Jesus and the apostles encountered a man born blind. 
And the disciples said, well, why is he blind? Was it his sin or his parents' sin? And Jesus said it was neither. It was so that God would be glorified. And we kind of say, hold up there. That sounds a little harsh, doesn't it? This man was made blind from birth so that God might be glorified? You think God's ever out to get you? You're probably not going to nod your head to that. But maybe he is for his reasons. I, I think we should be grateful God considers us worthy of his attention and working in our lives to refine us, even though it may be painful. He could ignore us and leave us on the, on the path to hell we're already on, but he chooses to work in our lives. In verse 5, Jesus knows the destruction that is waiting for those who don't repent. So thank God he is at work in our lives, that he cares for us, that he loves us. It does hurt sometimes, though. But God gave us, Jesus gave us two great commandments and a great commission. Two great commandments, love God with everything you got, heart, soul, mind, strength. Love your neighbor as yourself, both from the Old Testament. And then he gave the great commission, go into all the world, make disciples, teaching them, baptizing them. None of those commandments have clauses. Do it if you, you know, love God if your heart is pure for the last 24 hours. Go into all the world and make disciples if you haven't sinned recently or you don't hold a grudge against anyone. We're going to sin. We're going to have pain. We're going to have suffering. We still have those commandments and that commission. And as we will see in that parable, God expects us to be fruitful. I probably shouldn't say it this way, but one of my least favorite verses in the Bible is James 1, 2. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. James, I don't want to hear that, buddy. Consider it all joy when you encounter suffering is what he's saying. But listen to what he says in verses 3 and 4. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect, mature, and complete, lacking in nothing. So God is at work in our lives, yet we're sinners and we need repentance. And that's the point Jesus is making here. Not necessarily either person's fault that they sin. Now, sometimes our sin brings direct consequences. Have you ever been caught in a lie? That's a direct consequence of your sin. So, yeah, it, it happens. But what Jesus is saying is sin is sin, and we all need a Savior because of that sin, and we need to repent. In verse 3, the Greek word is repent. There, metanoia, as we already referenced. But the tense of it carries the idea of not only changing your ways, but continually changing your ways. In verse 5, when he uses it, the tense is immediately repent. And both are true. When we sin, when we're convicted of that sin, we immediately repent. Yet we continue doing that as we continue to sin, because we will. Because we live in a broken, fallen world, and we're sinners. And we need that salvation, and we need repentance. So we, we repent immediately, but we continue to repent as we need to. And again, it's a change. It's turning away from the sin to Jesus. And then what does he offer? It's like Oprah. You get forgiveness, and you get forgiveness, and you get forgiveness. We all get that forgiveness and a fresh start because of his compassion. Well, then he tells a parable that ties in with this as a follow-up, really, but it's an open-ended parable. We don't know the rest of the story, as, as some of you will remember Paul Harvey saying. We don't know what happens next. The book of Jonah is like that. I want to read the last couple of verses of Jonah to you just to kind of set the stage. Uh, then the Lord said, you had compassion on the plant for which you did not work, which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and left hand as well as many animals? Book over. What happened to the animals? What happened to these dummies who don't know their left hand from their right hand? Did God save Nineveh? We don't know. We don't know the rest of the story. And this parable is like that. We don't know what happened to the fig tree. Was it cut down the next year? But it's a rich parable. It's rich in meaning. There's a fig tree in a vineyard. The owner comes. He expects figs. There were none. If we go back to Leviticus 19, the rules for planting a new tree were clearly stated. You, you take no fruit from it in the first three years. It probably needed to mature and develop good fruit. But then in the fourth year, the offering belonged to the Lord. Only in the fifth year could the owner reap the fruit and profit from it. 
So if this man was following the law that Jesus refers to, and he probably was, this was the seventh year the fig tree had not produced fruit. And he was frustrated. Cut it down. It's a waste of space. Well, the supervisor of the vineyard said, no, let it be. I'll fertilize it. Give it a year. Then I'll cut it down if it doesn't produce. I want to pause there for a second and go back to Isaiah. We're going to read Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, and it will be on the screen as well. But I want, to hear, I want you to hear about the vineyard of the Lord as he compares the nation of Israel to a vineyard. Let me sing now for my well-beloved, a song of my beloved concerning his vineyard. My well-beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill. He dug it all around, removed its stones, and planted it with the choicest vine. And he built a tower in the middle of it and also hewed out a wine vat in it. Then he expected it to produce good grapes, but it only produced worthless ones. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why, when I expected it to produce good grapes, did it produce worthless ones? So now let me tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it will be consumed. I will break down its wall, and it will become trampled ground. I will lay it waste. It will not be pruned or hoed, but briars and thorns will come up. I will also charge the clouds to rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his delightful plant. Thus he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, a cry of distress. The nation of Israel is compared to a vineyard here, and it did not produce, and God cut it down. They were carried into captivity. Their king was eliminated. The holy relics were stolen. God expects us to produce fruit. We have to believe. We have to repent. But then our lives should show that faith producing fruit. He's patient with us. A great King James word is he's long-suffering. Honestly, God puts up with a lot of garbage from us. It's amazing that he loves us, which I guess is why John Newton wrote the song Amazing Grace, because it truly is so amazing. He owes us nothing but to do what he told the, the Pharisees in Matthew 3, to put the root, or I'm sorry, the ax to the root of the tree. It's another picture of a tree being cut down because it's not producing. God is patient. In 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, For the Lord is not slow as we count slowness, but his will is that everyone come to know him. Now, not everyone will, and we know that. But he loves us. He created us in his image, and he wants us to have a relationship with him. So he is patient. He is kind. But he wants us to come to him. Getting cut is what sinners deserve when faced with a righteous God. But he extends that grace if we, if we believe, and it starts with that repentance. There's another fig tree that shows up in the Gospels. And Jesus, last week on earth, he encountered a fig tree that was in full leaf. And a lot of people have problems with this action, but the fig tree should have had fruit on it. It looked like it should be bearing fruit. And Jesus went to find the fruit, and it didn't. It was a hypocritical tree. It was presenting a false front to the world. Jesus cursed it as an object lesson, and it withered and died. We have to bear fruit. We can look good. We're going to talk about that in the next section. But we have to bear fruit. And God is gracious. He is patient. But there will come a day when that ends. The great biblical commentator Warren Wiersbe said he once asked a friend, and I have no idea why he asked him this, but he said, what's the death rate in your city? And the man held up one finger, and Wiersbe kind of looked at him. He said, one apiece. He said, people are dying who have never died before. How about that? That's the day God's patience ends for each of us. That day will come. We must bear fruit. What are those fruits? Galatians 5.23. You'll see it on the screen. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. That is the fruit God's looking for in our lives if we are believers, if we have repented. We are all sinners who need to repent. The ugliness is our sin, and we need to turn from that. And then there's kind of a pause before we get to the next parables. Jesus is in a synagogue and heals a woman. So let's read that as we consider the bad. And our, our theme there is let go of hypocrisy and self-righteousness. 
So chapter 13, 10 through 17. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And there was a woman who for 18 years had had a sickness caused by a spirit. And she was bent double and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your sickness. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God. But the synagogue official, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, began saying to the crowd in response, There are six days in which work should be done. So come during them and get healed, but not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? And this woman, a daughter of Abraham as she is, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released from this bond on the Sabbath day? As he said this, all his opponents were being humiliated, and the entire crowd was rejoicing over all the glorious things being done by him. She'd been sick for 18 years. It was caused by a spirit, caused her to be bent double. It was a physical and a spiritual affliction. Satan had bound her, and she was bent over double because of it, and Jesus had compassion. He called her over. He said, come to me, which is interesting. But he called her over and said, you're free from his sickness, laid his hands on her, and immediately she was healed. And immediately she began glorifying God, which is fantastic. That's her response. How do we respond when we know God's active in our life? If it was a miracle like this, we probably would immediately respond. But too often we forget what God has done, or we, we and I'm ashamed to say I do that. I'll, it'll be a couple of days later, and I'll think, I, I never thanked God for that. I never gave him glory for that. So I love her response. Now, admittedly, she had been bent over for 18 years and afflicted by this spirit. But that should be our response when we know God's at work. We glorify him. Actually, we should glorify God in all things. That's the point of what James said, isn't it? Count it all joy. But she rejoiced. She glorified God. And Jesus said his purpose was to glorify God. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, I want to glorify you, Lord. Well, the synagogue official, he's a religious guy, kind of like a pastor, not naming any names at our church, but, you know, kind of like a pastor. And he stood up and was very indignant. And he said, how dare you heal on the Sabbath? This was work. That's how he defined work. You're healing someone. All Jesus did was lay his hand on her and say, you're free from your sickness. And she was healed. But he said, that's work. You can't do that on the Sabbath. You got Sunday through Friday to show up for healing. Don't be looking for that stuff on the Sabbath, the day we set aside for worship and rest. Now, I feel for the guy a little bit. He was kind of doing his job. He had probably invited Jesus to speak. He had heard about this rabbi and invited him to speak in the synagogue. And if you think about the Jewish people, there were certain things that set them apart. They worshiped one God, which was unusual in the area. It certainly wasn't the Roman way, the Greek way. They set aside the Sabbath. They didn't worship idols. This was a unique identifier for them. The Sabbath was holy, and it is still holy for Orthodox Jews today. So he considered that holy, and he felt and in his position he had to uphold the law. So he may have been a bit torn here. But you notice he doesn't address Jesus directly. He said that he didn't say, you shouldn't heal on the Sabbath. He said to the crowd, don't be showing up for this healing. You, you've got six other days you can be healed. Maybe he was a little scared of Jesus. Maybe he heard how Jesus had responded to other people who had baited him. I don't know. But he's kind of doing his job. But Jesus, and as, as Luke says in verse 15, but the Lord, recognizing Jesus' deity, the Lord answered him. And he didn't mince words hypocrites. Hypocrite in Greek basically means what we think it means, acting under assumed character, putting on a front, a false front. Now, I'm going to do something I shouldn't do. I'll probably regret it, but I'm going to point out the hypocrites in our church this morning. Are you ready? Look at the person next to you. Don't look at me. Look at the person next to you across the aisle. Lock eyes. Make sure you make that contact. That person is a hypocrite. Who is that person looking at? You. Who are all of you looking at now? Me. We are all hypocrites. Don't get upset over that. We all at times put on false fronts. For some of us, it's an entire lifestyle. For others, it happens occasionally. But we are sinners in a broken world. 
and we put on these false fronts. And this guy really kind of carried it to an extreme, I think. But we need to understand that and not be quite so holier than now when we consider this synagogue official because we have the same tendencies in us. So to some extent, we have that. But Jesus lowered the boom on him. You work on the Sabbath. You take care of your animals. Here's a woman, one of us, a daughter of Abraham who's been afflicted for 18 years. And how can you say that? How can you call this work? How can we not relieve her of what's happening in her life? I don't know why Satan bound her, but Jesus saw an opportunity to release her from this, and he showed compassion and did it. Any of you watch Monday Night Football? I know some people gave up the NFL. Well, apparently everybody in here did because nobody raised their hand. <laughs> There's a segment on the pregame show. Um, what's his name? Chris Berman and other people do it. But they show dumb plays or things that people shouldn't have done. Is anybody willing to admit they know what that segment is called? Wow. Okay. It's called, come on, man. And I picture Jesus looking at the synagogue official saying, come on, man, 18 years she has suffered. She has been possessed. She has been crippled. And you're calling this work? You go and make sure your animals are taken care of. Your animals are comforted. You give them water. You untie them and lead them there and give them water. That's not work. But healing a broken woman with a simple word is work. So the crowd cheered, probably didn't endear them to the synagogue leader, but it said they were rejoicing over the glorious things Jesus was doing, and that's wonderful. That's a lot better than hypocrisy, isn't it? But I have a question. Did those people repent? Did the synagogue official repent? Because if they did, and if they accepted that grace that God offers, we'll meet them one day as believers. If they didn't, they suffer the destruction that Jesus talked about. We can rejoice over things in church, but until we have that relationship with Jesus, we've repented and turned to him, it doesn't really matter. There's hypocrisy here, yet more importantly, there's healing and love and compassion. And we need to temper everything we do with compassion, and frankly, that's hard to do sometimes. I used to travel a lot in a job I had and I was in the Atlanta airport, which I absolutely despise, by the way. I don't know if I can get an amen on that, but um, I apparently actually had time between flights. And so I was already at my gate, and the, pre the flight before mine was boarding, so I had some time. And I was watching people. Anybody ever just sit and watch people? Okay, you'll admit to that, I guess. That's good. <laughs> we watch people, and we tend to judge them as we watch them. And I know you probably won't raise your hand to that, but you do it. You, you kind of assume, well, that's what they've done. That's where they're from. That's what they're up to. And for some reason, God just impressed on me as I saw someone walk in front of me. Image of God. She was made in the image of God. He was made in the image of God. Now, I'm not, I'm not a wonderful person, but God touched me in that moment. And I realized I don't have the right to judge anybody. Has that stopped me from doing it? No, but it did in that moment. And I realize that we need to show compassion because we don't know what is going on in someone else's life. But we do know that God created them to have a relationship with him. And we do know that he loves them. And we owe them nothing less as believers than that compassion that Jesus showed. Hard to do sometimes. But this guy is self-righteous. He's following the rules. And there's a phrase we use that on the surface sounds good, there but for the grace of God go I. And as a believer, that's true. The grace of God saves us. But too often we use that when we're looking down our noses at someone. At least I'm not like that person. At least I'm better than that. Well, that won't get you to heaven. All the good in the world you do won't get you to heaven. You can be the most wonderful person around, but if you haven't repented and accepted Christ as your Savior, you're not going to heaven. Matthew talks about, well, let's read, let's read it. Matthew 7. It's not going to be on the screen, I don't think. I can't remember if I put it there or not. Um, but Matthew 7, no, it's not going to be there. 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. 
Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Very sad words. And what Jesus is saying is there are a lot of people that show up at church that claim to know him, but they don't know him. They don't have that relationship with him. So we need to let go of hypocrisy and self-righteousness and trust him and trust God's love and show compassion. So let's keep reading. We finally get to the good, and there's been good throughout it, but the good is the kingdom of God grows as we grow in faith. So let's finish the, the passage here, 18 through 21. So he was saying, what is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? It is like a mustard seed which a man took and threw into his own garden, and it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air nested in its branches. And again he said, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. Two very short parables. In their comparisons, Jesus said, what shall I compare the kingdom to? They're not allegories. So many of the parables, even the disciples had trouble figuring out. You know, they'd go to him and say, what does this mean? You know, we don't understand it. These are very straightforward. These are comparisons to what the kingdom of God is. And what is the kingdom of God? Does it exist now? Well, it does. If you're a believer, you're a son or daughter of the king. But there's a tension in the kingdom. It's a, it's a yes, but not yet. Not fully realized yet, and it will be one day. But we're not quite there, but we are members of the kingdom, and it exists. So Jesus is telling us what it's like, what it compares to. And he starts with a mustard seed. And you remember elsewhere he said, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, which is a tiny, tiny seed, you can move mountains. And he said, well, a mustard seed turns into a big tree where birds of the air nest. So that little bit of faith, what both these parables, these many parables, are speaking of small beginnings that can lead to big endings or bigger things. So if you have that little bit of faith, that little mustard seed, it will grow into a tree and birds will nest in it. And here he's quoting Ezekiel. And the neat thing about Ezekiel, the verse he's quoting speaks of the nation of Israel going into a tree and God fulfilling his purpose in it. And the birds of the air represent every other nation coming to nest in it. That's who Jesus came for. So this is a beautiful image as he quotes Ezekiel that the kingdom of God will grow and people from every nation, tribe, and tongue, as John tells us in Revelation, will come and be a part of it. Then he talks about leaven. Leaven is like yeast. Unfortunately, the the bakers at this time couldn't run down to the store and buy a packet of yeast. So they took a bit of the old loaf, the sourdough, and put it in the flour for the new loaf, and it acted like yeast. It grew it. Has anyone ever had unleavened bread? Maybe you've done a Seder meal or, or something like that. It is hard, and it is flat, and can possibly be used as a weapon if you need to. It's not good. But you think of the beautiful loaves that come out of the oven once the yeast works, and the rising takes place, and the growth takes place. The leaven is just a little lump, but it affects the loaf and makes it grow and be something we love. There's two interpretations of these parables. The one is what I just gave you. It's a comparison, which really a little faith goes a long way. The kingdom will grow. But other people have said, no, these are allegories. They ignore what Jesus said about comparisons because they say a mustard seed or the typical mustard plant at that time grew into a bush and not a tree. There were varieties that grew into trees, and I think Jesus is intentionally making a point here that it grew much bigger. But people will say that, and they will say the birds represent evil, which they do in some places in the Bible. And then they'll talk about the leaven. And most of the time in the Scriptures when you discuss leaven, it represents evil. In just the previous chapter, Luke 12, Jesus said, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. Beware that insidious working as they try to introduce new laws and stuff. So people have interpreted this to mean, yeah, the kingdom will grow, but there's always evil, and it might be corrupt, and there might not be good in it. So if you look at that first interpretation, which I believe... It means you exercise your faith, you obey God, you make disciples, the kingdom will grow. If you look at that second interpretation, it means you exercise your faith, obey God, make disciples, the kingdom will grow in spite of the evil. You just add that phrase to it. You get the same result, growth in the kingdom of God. We are imperfect people. We are God's plan A for sharing the gospel, and there is no plan B. So naturally, there will be issues 
there will be evil that creeps in, there will be corruption, but the kingdom of God grows with just that little bit of faith that we need to exercise, and we'll experience that growth. And it's not growth about numbers, it's growth about souls, people coming to Jesus, people repenting. The mustard seed is the kingdom visible. It grows into a a big tree. The leaven is the kingdom invisible. It's the influence we offer as believers that can work into people's lives and cause them to grow and the kingdom to grow. And we get discouraged. We think our efforts in our service don't amount to anything. And we can't see the bigger picture. And we may never see the bigger picture this side of eternity. But think about this. Here's a, a, a carpenter, an itinerant rabbi who's preaching in a backwater province of the greatest empire on earth who you, you would assume would have very little influence. Within a generation, the gospel, the way, as they call Christianity, had spread north and east into Asia, north and west into Europe, south into Africa. Within a few generations, it was the official religion of the Roman Empire. Now, there's issues with that. But here we are today, 2,000 years later, celebrating a risen Savior. A little faith can go a long way. Zechariah 4.10, the prophet writes, do not despise the day of small things. Keep working. Keep exercising your faith. You don't know what it will lead to. The kingdom of God is based on faith. Remember, small beginnings, big endings. The kingdom of God grows as we grow in faith. We started with a need for repentance and ended up with a need for faith. True repentance never exists without faith. True faith requires real repentance. They're two parts of the same thing, the same process of belief and accepting the grace that God offers. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, the Apostle Paul writes, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We don't know where our faith leads. We can only walk by faith and trust Him to build the kingdom through our efforts guided by the Holy Spirit. So as you go home today or you go to the lake or the beach or you light the grill or you jump in the pool or you you light off fireworks or you just sit and watch it rain all day, I don't know what's going to happen today. But as you go, remember those immortal words of Chris Christofferson in the ballad he wrote, Me and Bobby McGee. Freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. Unfortunately, I don't buy that. In my not-so-immortal words, you have everything to lose if you pursue personal freedom freedom that's all about you. You have everything to gain if you pursue the freedom that Jesus offers. And that's the choice we have. It's the eternal question every one of us has to answer. Jesus said, whoever loses his life for my sake shall gain it. That's how we gain true freedom in him. Now, fortunately, Chris Christopherson wrote another song called Why Me? a little later in life. And I'm going to bless you by not singing it for you. But the chorus goes like this, Lord, help me, Jesus. I've wasted it so. Help me, Jesus. I know what I am. But now that I know that I've needed you so, help me, Jesus. My soul's in your hand. We're going to experience a time of invitation here, a time of response. That's really what it is. Have you experienced that true freedom? Have you repented? You can respond right where you are. You can come to the altar and pray. Someone will pray with you. But if you don't have that relationship with Jesus, if you just know about Jesus, but you don't know Jesus, our faith, those of us who are believers, is about a relationship. It's not about rules. It's about a man who was God, who died for us, who sacrificed his life, that we might have abundant life here, eternal life with him, and pay the price we can't pay. So respond to the urgings of the Holy Spirit, whatever that means, praying in place, coming to the altar. Several pastors will be here. You can speak with us. love to tell you more about Jesus and what he means to me and the freedom he represents. Repent and be faithful. Let's pray.